AI for decision making. Kick it away. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Today we'll present our work on uh, some of our work on generative artificial intelligence for decision making. So if you look in the progress in the last couple of years in generative modeling, we've gone from things like this, where it's just like these bedroom scenes that like don't look so accurate to like realistic images of different uh, animals and uh, classes of images uh, to like these very sophisticated scenes that you control using text descriptions. And if you look at the language space, you can also like, if you give it some uh, logical sequence like this, like line two, square four, pentagon, if you ask this like in 2020, uh, it's just completely uh, misunderstands it. If you ask it in 3.5, it like kind of gets the logic incorrectly. But by the time you ask it in like GPT-4, it's able to like kind of infer the logic and able is able to also uh, complete it. So we've seen a lot of progress in uh, scaling up and making large generative models bigger. Uh, and so I guess the question that we are gonna present a bit in this talk is the idea of how you can use generative AI to also improve decision-making. So if we look at the traditional decision-making stack, we have a couple of different uh, sections. So normally we have some type of, uh, or like at least model-based decision-making. Normally you have some type of world model. You have some type of task specification that describes what you want to do. And you have something that like kind of infers the actions that will like allow you to plan trajectories to reach your task. Uh, and for example, if you take a recent paper, Dreamer v3, you can see that like the task specification is some reward function. The world model is some type of recurrent state space model. And the action of selection is some type of policy at each state. Uh, and I think this has a couple of limitations. So first, it's relatively difficult with this framework to like combine different uh, tasks together. And in general, it like requires you to like learn these three separate models, this like uh, this world model, this actor, this value function, uh, and then each of them might have their own failure cases. They might be unstable. And as a result, when you when you learn all three of these, it actually can like seriously, uh, it, it can be very difficult to get a complete working system. So the first paper we'll talk about is the paper is conditional generative modeling all you need for decision-making. And our main idea in this paper, paper is trying to take this scaffold that we've that is normally done in model-based reinforcement learning and try to replace it with generative modeling or supervised learning counterparts that are much easier to train. So instead of planning over some type of uh, world model, we propose to learn a diffusion model that like captures trajectories in the environment. So it kind of serves as your world model again. And instead of uh, getting a policy that tries to infer actions to take at every state, we once we have this trajectory, we directly use an inverse dynamics model, which takes adjacent states and predicts the actions from them. And finally, uh, which again is closer to the supervised learning and generative modeling setting. And then finally, to do to to like to, uh, optimize for different rewards, skills, and constraints, what we do is we directly condition the generative model on each of these specifications. So this essentially just becomes a complete uh, generative modeling problem. Uh, and actually, and another thing we can do with this type of formulation is it's actually very easy to combine different behaviors or models together. Uh, so as some uh, as, as a as some introduction to diffusion models. So let's say we have a trajectory of states, which is shown on the right side. Uh, with diffusion models, you gradually add Gaussian noise to corrupt it, and you essentially learn a denoising network that, starting at this noisy state, learns to denoise it back to the original uh, clean trajectory. Uh, and in condition, uh, and and what we do to synthesize behaviors is essentially uh, we we denoise directly in state space, uh, like we talked about earlier, and then we uh, we then use an inverse dynamics model to infer uh, to like given two separate states, which infers the action to take. And I, and essentially, what we find is this type of uh, purely generative objective. So there's no no like value iteration or dynamic programming inside it. At least for a variety of different um, offline RL benchmarks, it actually performs very very similarly, or actually slightly better than existing TD learning approaches. Uh, so our numbers DD are shown on the right column as well as on the histogram on top. 
And we similarly find that on more, our more complicated tasks like D4RL kitchen, our approach actually more substantially outperforms existing offline RL methods. So like this suggests that like the current brand regenerative models are actually very powerful and they can actually learn, perhaps learn a lot of the, a lot of the things that we are trying to learn with like offline RL algorithms with a lot less instability. Uh, and another thing you can do is you can, so you can actually condition this model on constraints. So what you can do is you can just train the model to be conditioned on a gray block on top of a red one or a red block on top of a blue one. Uh, as well as you can also actually combine and compose multiple models together. So you can, if you have one, a one generative model that specifies, I want the red block on top of the blue one. And you have a second generative model that specifies, I want the gray block on top of the red one. What you can do is you can actually directly add the uh, denoising predictions to compose those two models together. So this allows you to essentially very uh, controllably change your behaviors, which is a very desirable uh, setting in this uh, offline decision-making setting. And another thing you can do is you can also uh, uh, use uh, uh, compose the models in a separate way through negation. So what you can do is you can say, I don't want the gray block on top of the red one. Uh, and this actually just corresponds to take, uh, negating the denoising prediction from the diffusion model. And you can see that if you do that, you're able to do the opposite thing. Uh, yeah, and in general, you can see that for these like constraint satisfaction tasks, uh, especially since the reward is pretty sparse, um, Directly learning this type of planning approach substantially outperforms existing methods. Uh, and you can also see it. And also we, we uh, outperform prior methods that leverage this type of like model-based composition to do planning. Uh, so, so in both settings, just having this simple generative model can do, perform pretty well. And another thing you can do is you can actually uh, compose different skills together. So you can condition one diffusion model on a particular skill such as bound. Uh, and you can compute, uh, and then you can condition another diffusion model on the scale pace. Uh, and what you can do is then by adding the noise predictions together by composing the models, you can now generate this, uh, this behavior that's a mix between the bound and pace thing. And actually, if you look at the bottom row, uh, that represents the predicted uh, behavior from a classifier. And you can see it iterates between bound and pace and then bound and pace again. So by again, by directly combining, composing these generative models, we actually have have a lot of flexibility in making new behaviors. Mm -hmm. Just a quick question. So you mentioned directly combining them, but how are they combined? Do you just like combine literally the action outputs from both of these models? Uh, no. So 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 essentially, each model predicts this uh, has this like denoising prediction. Uh, and what you do to combine two models together, you add the two denoising predictions together. Uh, and actually, it turns out you can mathematically show that it's the same as uh, taking the product of the two distributions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, cool. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Okay, cool. Let me move on then. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, so basically, as a recap, what we've shown here is kind of an alternative approach for model-based planning, uh, where we essentially fold everything into the generative modeling procedure as much as possible. So planning has been converted into diffusion over trajectories. Action selection has been converted into inferring actions from adjacent states in a trajectory. And like task specifications such as reward skills and constraints have been, for, have been like replaced with, condition, uh, with conditioning. Uh, and this essentially tries to make generative modeling as close to the supervised re learning regime as possible, uh, and also has some unique aspects in terms of test time compositions of behaviors. There, I think there are still, a, but like, I think one thing that we really like about generative models is the fact that they can, we can use them for a lot of tasks. So if I have a large language model, I can use it to search up relevant information. I can use it to help me code. I can use it to help revise my text. Well, like the model we've described earlier is still not that universal. It's, it, again, it relies on the specific state space so that you can do diffusion over the trajectories and relies on these like 
reward skill and, const and constraints that you have to gather data and explicitly teach the model. So, so the first thing, is, so, so still it seems like this current approach is a bit far away from like having an agent that can do a wide variety of things. And uh, I have a question, um, could I mm -hmm. before you move on to the next thing? Um, it's just, uh, so you showed like some uh, results on like D4RL tests, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I was wondering like, so how do you actually like specify like goals for a task like uh, Franklin Kitchen? So like, what are you actually conditioning on there? Oh, yeah, I can, I can take that question. So, uh, yeah, are you asking about how to condition on uh, uh, specific constraints? Uh, not for on constraints, like so for like, for example, in the Franca Kitchen D4RL environment, like where you have to you know, solve a specific sequence of tasks in a certain order, um, like what's like the, what do you actually train on and what do you like oh, yeah, condition? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so the conditioning is still on the reward and like the initial state, the training, since you, since it's uh, the training is on like the D4RL data set. Now there are three forms of data set, whereas, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think mixed and partial, like I could be like getting the names wrong, which provides uh, suboptimal demonstration or, or, or partial demonstrations. So every time a subtask is performed, you get a reward of plus one or, you know, 0.25, depending on your normalization. And, you know, like that's how it increments. So I think uh, it's still trained on like the same uh, setting as every other offline Narel algorithm, which means that it's just like trained on, you know, like uh, the, it's trained on the D4RL data set and the conditioning is on the reward. By reward, I mean like the ret the return technically, and uh, also like on the initial state. So like the like the sparse reward, right? So like when you solve the task. Um, yeah. So if you do that, like uh, I believe, I think it's in Kitchen Mix. Um, there's no single demonstration that actually solves all the tasks. So like you get a maximum reward of like four. Um, but like the demonstration that you actually get in Kitchen Mix, I believe they only do up to three tasks. So um, when I mean, the diffusion model is conditioned to, I guess, only work at at most three tasks. Um, um, yeah, but even that's, so that's a good point. I think like, uh, but I think like it also depends on the state, right? So maybe you complete like, uh, like the three, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, it's conditioned on three tasks, but it could, can happen that maybe once you have completed, like, let's say two tasks, you're in a state from which you know how to complete two additional or three additional tasks. Or let's say you have completed one task and you fall in a state from where you have seen demonstration that has like three additional tasks from there. So you can still like uh, complete it. But uh, if you look at the raw numbers, I think we don't get 75, uh, like we usually like still get below 75%. So it could be probably happening that, you know, it's kind of like uh, still, uh, you know, like, doing three tasks at most. But to be fair, like all the other often RL algorithms also like usually get around like uh, less than 75. Like if you can check the numbers from the previous like slides. Okay, so so basically this kind of stitching which we ideally want to happen is still not happening here, right? Uh, it depends, right? So that's what we have to analyze just cause, okay. So you're pointing out a, a good issue that uh, we only see three, uh, success task, but all the episodes in which three tasks are done start from different starting state. So it can happen that, you know, like uh, you do one task and then you go to a starting state where you, from where you have seen demonstration of how to do the next three tasks. And I think that's how the stitching takes place. But I cannot like, while I can say that that could be a possibility, I, I don't think I've empirically verified it. So that's what I would, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, great. Yeah. Uh, cool. Uh, yeah. So, so, so yeah. So I, I, again, this is a brief recap, uh, where we are. So, uh, so we, uh, so we've essentially introduced this, uh, paper is conditional generative on, uh, modeling all you need, where you try to like, uh, make model-based reinforcement learning as close to generative modeling as possible. Um, but, but we still have some like lack of universality, both in the task specification, as well as the fact that the world model is in state space. So we have another. Uh, so we have another paper where we try to make this as general purpose as possible. We want to have one model that can solve many, many different tasks. And the idea is uh, uh, taking insights from uh, uh, like the recent language models. You can use language as a pretty generic task specification for a very large number of tasks. Uh, and what you can do is you can make uh, you can use images as a pretty generic 
state representation for a variety of different tasks. So although a lot of tasks you cannot have different state spaces, the actual visual images of the task end up looking very similar. So you can use so you, you can essentially use the images um, or a conditional video generation to, to depict the sequence of states. Uh, and then the action selection is again inverse dynamics. So like, and then uh, uh, and then essentially we call this paper a universal policy, but it essentially is takes uh, is essentially the this uh, the is conditional it's generative modeling all you need paper where we just modify the task specification to be language and the world model to be a video. And then I think and then basically it actually is very very similar to the previous presentation, uh, except for this different interface. Uh, but what it allows you to do is it allows you to learn a single model that can make synthesize this plan here. So this is completely generated, as well as synthesize this plan here, which is also completely generated. Uh, as, and this plan here, where you uh, want to take out a spoon from, from a dishwasher. And also this plan here, where you want to wipe, use a sponge to wipe this cardboard. So essentially, by, by just slightly generalizing the idea of the decision diffuser paper, we can now solve a huge number of tasks using a single model. And actually, uh, uh, you can also, because of the fact that like you're now using videos as your state representation, you can also use all the data on the internet as additional data to learn your planner. So your planner can be directly trained from videos on the internet also. I can take it from here. Yep. Uh, yeah. So I'll take it from here. And uh, yeah, so you don't basically, you know, like developed a nice story of how to first simplify the model based decision making, and then how to, you know, like make it as universal as possible. So the question we come to is, okay, is the universal policy uh, representation all we need for decision making? I mean, in theory, that might be like, you can, you can say that, okay, if you scale it up enough, like that might be the right answer. But let's see if like it's computationally efficient or uh, can we do better? So let's think of a task where we have to make a cup of tea. Now, if you have to, if you imagine the steps involved in a cup of tea, such as even finding the tea, uh, you know, like picking up the mug, warming up the water and many other steps, you will see that, you know, planning and visual space is very computationally inefficient and might even be intractable because you just might not initially know whether, you know, like where the tea bag is. So in this, like in the next work that I'm going to present, like we argue that, you know, efficient decision making requires, you know, many different aspects of knowledge. For example, uh, semantic knowledge, where you know, like where you know where to look for tea. Like you know, when we go into a new home, such as an Airbnb, we know that you know the tea would be more or le less likely be in the kitchen area. Secondly, uh, physical knowledge. Let's say when the cup is in front of us, and like you know, we want to grasp it. How? What physical steps do we take? How do we move our hands to grasp the cup? And then the control knowledge, like once we have like an, you know, an imaginary, uh, once we know like what physical steps to take, how do we even execute it? So what actions to accomplish uh, such a physical task? So these are the three different like sources of, no of knowledge that really allows for, uh, you know, efficient decision making. So in this work, you know, like we take the semantic knowledge from uh, internet text, we take physical knowledge from internet videos and control knowledge from egocentric images in which like some kind of control task is being performed. So we basically like, uh, you know, like for, as a proxy for internet text, we use large language model. Uh, we train our video diffusion model or we pre-train our video diffusion model on internet videos. And, uh, you know, like we also pre-train our action or at least the top few layers of our action model on egocentric images. Mm -hmm. And we refer to, you know, like the first component as task planning, second as visual planning and third as action planning. And uh, this is like, good, yeah, this is like one of our recent work where we try to, you know, make use of all three, you know, like uh, three different like foundation models to, you know, like do uh, training together. So basically a large language model, you have sub goal to like a visual planner. The issue is that large language model is blind. So it might give sub goals that might not exactly be feasible. And this is where uh, video diffusion allows for physical uh, possibility, which means it tries to see if, okay, if I generate a video given this sub goal and given a particular starting image, does this video have high probability or not? And similarly, like the video diffusion sends a video plan to action planning. Now action planner also says whether the video that was sent to me, can that be executed or not? So it basically like, uh, like, so at each level, 
So basically from left to right, we go from, you know, sub goal to video plan to control, but also like there's a feedback, uh, you know, like back from every level. We refer to this feedback as iterative refinement, and this basically ensures that, you know, all three models are kind of generating consistent plans. Now, let me try to describe, you know, like this in more details. So let's say we have, uh, you know, like, uh, let's say we have a trajectory with like sub goals W, uh, you know, one to WM. Uh, also, like let's represent a particular video trajectory by tau x, and you know, like a particular action trajectory by tau a. If we were given a label trajectory with sub goals and like uh, you know, and basically video corresponding to each sub goals, in that case, uh, in in that case, we can you know write that trajectory under our model as follows. Uh, as you can see, p theta here refers to L and p phi refers to uh, video diffusion and p, uh, you know, like, uh, sorry, p phi and p psi refers to action planning. Even though, uh, and basically to optimize this model, we use maximum log likelihood. So now let me try to describe, even though I've written it as like a single joint, we can technically uh, optimize each of these models separately and then just use iterative refinement during the test time to ensure that they are being consistent. Since the first part is large language model, it basically like it basically requires prompting with few examples just so that the output is provided in the right way and you know the few examples give some domain uh, generic domain information uh, similarly like in visual planning this is same as you know like this can be shown equivalent to a uh, minimizing denoising diffusion loss objective and the third thing is again minimizing the mse loss which is you know maximizing uh, you know log likelihood and the gaussian inverse dynamics so now let me try to walk through uh, an example of what happens so let's say we have a particular observation and a goal. And then, you know, like this goal gets first taken, in, you know, it gets sent to large language model, which is task planning. It basically, you know, receives it and it generates a bunch of candidate like sub goals. Now, a large language model doesn't know what the co correct visual observation is. So this is where the iterative refinement comes in from the visual planning. And basically the idea is that we need to select a sub goal that, not, that maximizes the product of these two things. So basically it uh, technically, it basically, yeah. So technically uh, it the diffusion model, uh, like theoretically you should calculate which uh, sub goal lead to a high probability video trajectory and basically choose that sub goal. But that requires, you know, sampling of video for every uh, candidate sub goals. Hence in our paper, we do have a baseline which where we exactly do that. But in our paper, uh, rather a simplification would be can we just like see how a particular sub goal, whether it's consistent with the current observation or not? And for that, we can again, like if you were to write down probability, you can write down uh, it as a function of a large language model, uh, like probability of a large language model and a density ratio. Now this density ratio can be modeled by a multi-class classifier, which basically chooses from M sub candidates, uh, which chooses from M, M sub candidate sub goals. Now you might ask, okay, you still require, you know, like data to train a multi-class classifier, right? So we will answer that question much later where I also show you how to not use any extra data to train that classifier or what could be replacement for the, that classifier. The other question you might have is, okay, if you're using data to learn classifier, why not just like learn a, you know, why not just like learn a VLM? Now in our case, like uh, we found that classification is a much simpler problem than just uh, generating a bunch of sub goals and like learning, uh, you know, like uh, these things from scratch. So once we have selected those right sub goals, as you can see by the classifier, uh, the visual planning uh, basically generates a video. Now let's closely take a look at the video. Sometimes the video can be a bit jaggy. As you can see, like maybe I can just like replay it uh, just so that you can. So as you can see, when it's trying to pick up the uh, pick up the pan, it can like uh, be a bit shaky. And some th that's not always the case, but sometimes that's the case, and we want to avoid that situation. This this is where you know the iterative inference from action planning comes in, where uh, you know, where basically again like it uh, amounts to maximizing uh, like choosing a tower, choosing a uh, sorry choosing a video trajectory that maximizes this uh, probability distribution. This basically amounts to you know biasing the denoising process of video diffusion from like the logics that we get from action model. And once you do that, I think you can, you usually get like much smoother videos and it helps, you know, and uh, it usually helps when you're uh, doing, performing some kind of a pick action, because that's when, you know, wrong prediction of action leads to, you know, like uh, the robot not being able to pick up the right object. And once you have done iterative inference, uh, you know, like uh, you basically give the command. So this is the, 
like this is the approach so far. So let me like talk about some of the task domains that we initially focus on. And then I will start, tell you also how to scale this up. So our first task domain, this is uh, kind of inspired from clipboard paper. Uh, you know, it's also like uh, other people have also used this uh, framework where the idea is to, you know, it's, you need to basically paint blocks and like organize them in a specific uh, order. Uh, order configuration, but sometimes the objects of right color might not be given to you. So you first need to pick things up and then like place in the object of like right color. And then you again need to, you know, like, uh, yeah, you basically need to pick up the white blocks, like place it like somewhere and, you know, like put it in the, in the right configuration. Now, in some cases, some of the blocks might already be present. So you can't just blindly do this because what if you're trying to, you know, like, uh, what if the, the yellow block is already present and you just wasted another white block picking, making it yellow. So that's where, you know, iterative inference from visual planning allows you to, uh, you know, condition your sub goals on, you know, like current observation. Similarly, let's consider, uh, you know, a related domain, which is object arranged task. You need to pack a bunch of things into uh, like the brown box. Now note here that some objects might not be visible. Uh, as you can see, the green at, and white strip towel is not visible. There's there's a you know there's a green object that we call a dirty object. So basically, the model you know like uh, it basically like you first need to find the dirty object, maybe uh, see what the identity of the dirty object is, and again like place it back into the yeah basically place it play, place it back into yeah place it back into the brown box. And the third thing is again like kitchen task, but it's a slightly different form of kitchen task. I think I took it from uh, like. Uh, Victoria, uh, you know, from CMU had like a paper on how how can we make this kitchen domain more general, and this is where uh, like uh, sorry, I think uh, let me yeah yeah how to make the domain more general, and basically like uh, we basically change the texture of the kitchen, and uh, there are usually four sub goals given, and sometimes one of the sub goals might already be done. So let's take a look at the results. So I think. Um, I'll describe more in details as like I go through. So Gato is a pretty good baseline. If you were to replace, if you were to literally do, uh, it's an example of a goal condition policy. If you were to actually like, uh, I, I should preface that when I say Gato, I mean Gato in the best possible sense that I could produce. I don't have access to, you know, like deep Google DeepMind code, which was also pre-trained on a bunch of like other tasks. So I, I would rather, so, so I, I should put that as Gato star. Uh, and this is a goal condition policy. I would say that, you know, like architecture here matters because if you were to take, train a, take a regular transformer and basically train a BC on it, the performance will be much, much lower. Uh, and you can look that in the paper. Then comes the action planner, which is also a decent baseline. Like uh, uh, basically like rather than trying to predict one action, you chunk multiple actions together. And like usually like the failure cases are, are like, uh, and usually the failure, failure cases in this method uh, revolves around picking up something or basically like, like in the kitchen task, if you're trying to, uh, you know, like turn on up, that's where you need to make the actions really precise. And this like, you know, this, yeah, like this is where most of the failure cases take place. Third is UniPy, which is, which is what you, you presented last. I should uh, also say this is UniPy star, which means uh, it's a, it's a video on action planner. But it's not using the Imagen architecture because Imagen is very expensive to train and uh, I just did not have the computational resources. So the video diffusion trained in this paper was PVDM. So uh, which is like a, like, which is supposed to be kind of a faithful reproduction of UniPy tasks. Uh, and basically our, the, you know, like our own method HIP, uh, you know, it also uses like the same uh, underlying video diffusion. And as you can see, just like leveraging language models and like trying to divide it in different form of sub goals does lead to, you know, like lots of like improvement. And let me now, now try to uh, show you like, okay, what are some benefits of iterative refinement? Yeah. So note the really benefit in iterative refinement comes from, you know, like when you don't have any visual refi uh, refinement, that means you're selecting sub goals blindly. And that's where it's, you know, like you really run into a lot of failure cases. And this is how, you know, like, so this is how, yeah, so basically I mentioned before, okay, how can we not like learn a classifier, right? So currently we are doing visual refinement using a learned classifier. So you can technically use a frozen VLM uh, to basically ask, uh, you, you can basically ask it questions. Okay, it, it, and the questions can be form of, okay, is screwdriver in the brown box or is a particular sub goal uh, completed or not? And this is the VLM we use in this, uh, you know, in this particular work is called mini GPT-4. Again, note that this work was done at a time when GPT-4B was not out yet. 
So I think like we see that like for the simpler pain block tasks, uh, like a vision language model that uh, has just not been trained on any of these simulated domains, you know, like does pretty well and object rearranged, it does slightly worse. I actually, you know, like a few days back, I did try playing with GPT-4 vision and just the, without not even using it as like classifier, but directly asking it to predict sub goals. I think it was actually doing a decent, uh, like in some cases it was predicting the first four sub goals as right and the fifth as wrong. But I think that's fine because you can always, you know, like execute one sub goal and replan. So I think GPT-4v, once the API is available, might be a very, you know, like strong part to, you know, like, yeah, it might be very strong component for the first part of our, uh, for the first part of it. And then we also show benefits of pre-training. Again, this was note that this was done at a, this work was submitted to Europe. So like I want to keep, you know, like highlight that because after that work, many other data sets have come that can be used for pre-training such as OpenX. So in our case, we use Ego 4D for pre-training. Now, even though Ego 4D is kind of very different from our domain, it still like benefits us. Like, as you can see in some of the cases, uh, if you use Ego 4D pre-training, you know, just like, uh, you can just get away with using 75% of the original twin data and get the same performance as the model with which you did not undergo any pre-training. Now, my hunch is that if you were to pre-train your model on OpenX data set and do real world tasks, not simulated tasks, I think you will see much more benefits of pre-training. So one of the things we wanted to highlight in the work is that while we are, like while this is one version of what we intend to do, like, uh, you know, like future work can further improve on like these ideas. And also the same is true for, you know, like uh, action model or inverse dynamics. Uh, in our case, we, uh, that when we were, uh, you know, like when we were submitting the paper, a paper called VC1 came out that is basically like pre-trained on a bunch of Ego 4D images. So if you have VC1 as initialization, it really allows you to use less number of trajectories. You can get to like, a, like for example, in the first two case, uh, if you were to train from scratch, you would kind of need like 10K trajectories to really get good performance. With VC1 initialization, you can just use 1K trajectory. Uh, for the kitchen task, I think you can get away with like 3.5K trajectories from what we yeah, note, noted. So, so far I've basically presented, you know, all the tasks that are still in simulation. So you might ask, okay, can this be really done in like the real world? Because these are all simulation tasks. So this is actually a recent paper that you submitted to uh, iClear and it's also an archive. So basically, if you were to scale up each of these components, which means uh, you uh, like rather than physically ground, rather than you know visually grounded the grounding and LLM, you you use Palm E uh, to basically like as you can see, you use Palm E to do like some kind of an exhaustive tree search and uh, and also video diffusion to further imagine different videos, right? So you're using combination of Palm E and video diffusion to do a tree search. And once you have done that, you can actually go for a real world, uh, like real world execution of like your plans. So basically what I'm trying to say is that, you know, like while uh, like, yeah, like that, that, that the, that the ideas that was presented in HIP can be further scaled up and actually made uh, to work on real world robot as long as you scale it up further. So, so far I've, uh, you know, like presented uh, some kind of a, this, like, like something like this model where, you know, for decision-making, we have a task model, we have a visual model and we have an action model. Now we are not saying that this is like exactly what you need, but rather we are, we are imagining a world that where we don't technically train a single monolithic model, but rather we leverage foundation model already available to us to do like for decision-making. So for example, uh, you know, like uh, if you, like technically you can use uh, mid-level vision, which, which means like segmentation models such as SAM for purpose of your task. Uh, you know, future work can also like rely on audio model if you just want someone to say the task and not like specify through language. And also you can, uh, if you have partial observability, you can also use uh, something like a memory model. And here a memory model can refer to like a semantic 3D map as an example. And like basically all these components, you know, can interact together for like decision-making. So the worldview that we are trying to push is that rather than training a one monolithic model, which really requires to, uh, which really requires spare data to be trained on, we should, you know, like one, the other approach is to kind of leverage already existing uh, foundation model and basically ensure that they're kind of consistent with one another, another and use them for decision-making. So yeah, this is all we have for today. And, you know, like uh, we are happy to take uh, more questions like together. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Any questions? Uh, yeah, so uh, so like for the no pre-training version of these um, video diffusion models, like what's like the general magnitude of data that you use um, to get like a reasonable, reasonable video diffusion model? Oh yeah, that's a great point. So uh, in this case, 100% of the data actually meant about uh, 100K trajectories or 90K trajectories. I think uh, I'm, I could be slightly missing the detail, but I think it's in that magnitude. So if you look at the paper, I think that should have the exact numbers, but yeah, at least 100K trajectories. My hunch is that if you were to use OpenX data, which already has a million traject, uh, million episodes, maybe you might be able to get away with, and if you're doing real world uh, training, cause you know, like OpenX is very much biased towards real world. And that makes sense, right? So if you have to solve now real world tasks, if I have to take a bet, I think 1000 trajectories for, uh, uh, that even sounds as, that still sounds a lot, but I think like you can get away with much lesser number of real world trajectories if you were to use OpenX like data. Again, this is just a hypothesis based oh. on what like. Uh, we actually, so actually recently we've been training a lot of models uh, from scratch. Mm -hmm. You actually need not that much data. So actually. I think uh, you 30,000 trajectory, like without any pre-training, I think 30,000 30, videos 000. is enough. Okay. Uh, actually we were training uh, from scratch a model on robots uh, for for picking up objects using only a thousand videos and that was enough. Oh, that's uh, interesting. Yeah. So I don't think you need that much. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. So some, yeah, sometimes. Uh, yeah, sorry, have, uh, yeah, we have in, in this uh, recent, uh, in this video language modeling paper, uh, we trained video models on a couple of different robotics domains. Uh, there was one robotics domain where we wanted to generate multi-view images. Uh, so there was no pre-training pre data at all. Uh, and we actually had no data of that task. So we essentially, uh, gather the data ourselves, and there were a total of a thousand videos, uh, and it was able to generalize the new videos and synthesize new plans pretty well. Oops, yeah. Okay, that's actually quite surprising, but it's pretty good to know. Yeah, actually, I I don't I feel like one of these things is these video models actually are not that expensive to train. Uh, we have we do actually have a if you go to the video language uh, planning paper, we actually have a link to a different code base that I think works pretty well, even with a thousand, yeah, like a thousand or 10,000 videos is sufficient, I think. So in order to generate like a new frame, what's like the context history, like how many frames do you use uh, like um, for the context? Uh, we primarily use one. Uh, we had this paper that we didn't really present here called Unisim, uh, where we actually use four. Uh, more frames of context helps a lot. Uh, we are just lazy and we only used one primarily. Yeah. Maybe let me just add one more thing. So this, okay, this is not a current capability, but one bet I, I'm willing to make is maybe in future, you might be able to, you know, like use in context learning with video diffusion where you sit, have, you know, give it like five trajectories. So, so that rather than fine tuning on your domain, you know, if you have a general enough model, you can adjust your domain by just passing it as you know, like few trajectories from our domain. Again, this is like a very unscientific thing. I just like claim this is a hunch I have. I could be like wrong, but yeah. Yeah, that would be interesting. And like, you can also do some types of prompting with the models. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah, we actually have another paper on like just probabilistically prompting the models. Yeah. So like you can train a pretty small model with only a couple hundred trajectories where we even like gathered only like 20 trajectories or something mm -hmm. like this. And then you can actually use that to adapt an existing model. Yep, yeah, that's, yeah, that's pretty neat. Yeah. Any other okay. Questions? Any yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I guess I was wondering one related to. It's a more high level question. So you're designing a lot of combination of methods, or like piecing together pieces, and it's really the question of, you know, combining these different components versus using end to end, mm -hmm. you know, like reinforcement learning and decision making methods. Do you have any comments on that? Like, do you think these will scale well? Uh, in comparison to end-to-end -to -end training? Yeah, so I, I actually, I have some commentary and then NRAC will probably also have the commentary yeah. also. Uh, my feeling is end-to-end -end training uh, works pretty well for like kind of low-level skills or something like this. But I think that like, if you want to do end-to-end -end for these like very long horizon tasks, I think bad propagation just does not, like it's just very hard to train. So one thing that is true is if you look at all of these text-to-image uh, generative models nowadays, uh, they're not just like, it's not just train a generative model on images and then you have great images. 
Uh, there's actually a lot of engineering, a lot of these compositions of models. Yep. Like actually uh, the classifier pre guidance is specific composition of models. And that's the crucial thing that makes results that good. So I think like end to end learning has like, at least in generative modeling, end to end learning hasn't really uh, worked that well, except for language. Cause I think language is relatively low dimensional. Uh, I think that, I think that like just having this composition allows you to, um, to really have each model kind of specialize and like use the kind of combine the strengths together. Uh, in a more effective way than just end-to-end -end learning does. And also end-to-end -end learning, I think, uh, I mean, it's hard to really like, uh, yeah, I would say that it's also like a matter of data requirement. So sometimes for end-to-end -end learning, you really require paid data. Whereas like what we are saying is that even if you were to do end training, end-to-end -end training, bootstrapping from, you know, like these models that are kind of trained on single sources of data. And then like, you know, starting from there, like will take you a long way. Uh, and, you know, so yeah, like the thing is that like you don't want to get bottlenecked by availability of like paid data. And also when you move to like, uh, so I have an upcoming paper that, you know, should be out in a few months. Uh, if you're in a partial observable settings and if you're trying to build a 3D instance map, there I don't even know like where to, you know, like get like a very good paired data for such things. And having these, you know, models available to us, like, uh, like in building a 3D instance map, for example, having models such as Dino that allows you to, you know, extract visual features and kind of build a 3D semantic map, things like that, like it really helps uh, out. So my hunch is that, yeah, it's, it's just more of a matter of data requirement. And also the other thing I would say is one thing which we like, uh, let's look at GPT-4V system. Is it end-to-end -end or is it like, kind of like, uh, you know, like kind of multiple things combined? Uh, I don't have any access to the architecture, but like from what I, gather i think like the gpt4 can also like gpt4 also has a route that only takes in language and has another route that takes in vision so i'm assuming there is like you know like some uh even though it's a single architecture within that architecture there might be multiple sub components and the same thing is true for you know image and architecture if you see like uh or like even stable diffusion you have like a vq vq gan you know like tokens and then you basically like uh you know, you build like a smaller latent map from those tokens. And then basically like you try to do stable diffusion on top of it. So sometimes even an end-to-end -end architecture might have multiple monolithic components. And the last thing I would say is, you know, like uh, we might have our own biases and that's fine to, you know, like place bets on, but in the end, like whatever, like it's the empirical evidence, right? Whatever gives us the best empirical performance, like, you know, like should give us more signal as to what to do. Yeah, I, I think the question I have um, is like, um, you know, so so the so the main thing when you have these separate foundation models that interact is that interaction layer, like you talked about, that um, uh, that iterated refinement that you have to do. Like, how 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 far can that get us versus like having this joint model which can you know share all its features, like a joint vision language model instead of like you know just a vision model and a language model interacting, uh, right? So like. Um, I guess like what we're seeing is that like, you know, we're trying, uh, uh, you know, companies are training these large multimodal models that share these representations. And I guess once you have enough of that, you don't need these different components, right? Uh, is that like, do you agree with that? So I think right now uh, the multimodal models uh, do not work very well. Like I guess during the summer when I was at Google, um, I like the R22 model, for example, it just doesn't really work. Uh, whenever you change the visual scene, uh, like a lot, it basically just doesn't work that well. Uh, I think that, uh, again, like from the generative modeling point of view, uh, language is very nice and easy to model because it's low dimensional. But I feel like once you get to these multimodal signals, I'm not super sure how well these systems work. At the moment, they don't work very well. Uh, I think they are still like, in the, in the sense that I feel like LLMs maybe work 90% of the time. I think a lot of these multimodal models maybe work 5% of the time. Uh, I, and then I guess my, maybe some people will say you can just use scaling to make them better to reach the LLM performance, but I kind of doubt it. Uh, Cause I remember even in 2018, uh, OpenAI was trying to scale these image models and they never really scaled that well. So uh, I think that language has been the only thing that has scaled very well. Uh, on the other hand, um, in terms of like this interface, I think one thing you can do when you have this interface of iterative refinement, uh, you can actually still differentiate through the interface and like learn how to communicate jointly also. I just think like that's the idea that you have these models that have already specialized, you've trained on tons of data. You can still use some uh, like end-to-end -end data training or maybe like embodied interaction in the world to basically tune the interface between these models. And I think that can 
uh, because these models are so powerful. I just think I think like just tuning the interface already gives you enough power to do things, and I gives you I think it gives you much more modularity. Yep. So let me just build upon what Yulin said because that's uh, the original question was in context of VLMs, right? So. So again, I should preface, I really don't know the architecture of GPT-4V, but all the other open source models that have been present, they do one of the two things, basically. They have a vision encoder, they have a large language model, and then they train some kind of alignment module. The alignment module is uh, either like, uh, you know, like an MLP as in Lava 1.5, or, you know, like linear layer as in mini GPT-4, or, you know, like, I think there's a Cog VLM paper that I read that had like an MLP plus like a Llama adapters, which was kind of, you know, processing the visual layers. So at least in context of VLMs, it seems that you start from, you know, a language model and a visual encoder, such as a VIT encoder, and then you kind of tune the interface, uh, you know, like uh, to make them compatible with one another. And that seems to be the solution now. Now, uh, again, the best performing uh, VLM is GPT-4V. So I really don't know the architecture of that, but that's what I would say. I think that's also like seems the right way to go, but I think we'll see. Yeah, I do feel like uh, GPT-4V is pretty similar in performance to Google internal one. I see. And then I think that one was very unreliable. I see, that's, yeah, that's fair, yeah. Okay, okay. yeah, thanks, makes sense. For the most part. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the talk. Uh, really enjoyed it. And yeah, let's leave it at that. Yep. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Take care.